Thank you, Chairman Grothman, Ranking Member Garcia, and all the members of the committee for inviting me to testify today on behalf of Global Christian Relief. I'd like to begin my testimony today by showing you a picture of a woman named Abigail. She's a young mother of three who, until last year, lived in a small Christian village in northern Nigeria, which I'll be visiting just next week. On the night of March 22nd, 2022, Islamic gunmen stormed Abigail's village, shooting dozens of her friends and family members. After the attack, Abigail was nowhere to be found. It would be days afterwards that the terrorists would call, using the villagers' own stolen cell phones to let her know, let folks in her family know that Abigail and others had been kidnapped. She's one of just 8,000 almost 8,000 Christians who have been abducted in the last three years in Nigeria. And she remains missing today as I testify before you. Her story is emblematic of the truly horrific levels of violence many people face today because of their faith, the faith that they've chosen to follow. Contrary to popular belief, religious persecution is not a thing of the past. It's a major and growing challenge around the world with billions of people living in nearly 80 countries that maintain high levels of government restrictions or social hostility towards people of faith. Faith really is under fire today. For Christians specifically, the numbers are staggering. Approximately 360 million Christians globally are experiencing high levels of persecution or discrimination just for their beliefs. In Abigail's home country of Nigeria, terror groups driven by extremist ideology have killed 12,793 Christians since 2019. We know that all these victims are explicitly targeted for being Christians, both because the killers and kidnappers often expressly say so, and because Christians are suffering killings and abductions at a rate vastly disproportionate to other faiths in the region. In China, over 100 million Christians must practice their faith under an almost totalitarian system of laws and surveillance. Refusing to join a government-controlled church is illegal, but as many as 60 million Chinese Christians choose to do so regardless of the cost, risking their freedom and social standing to worship and hear sermons not dictated for them by the Communist Party members. Some governments, and especially U.S. adversaries, choose to co-opt religion to support violent aggression against their rivals and engage in religious persecution. As Ranking Member Garcia mentioned, the Russian government has formed what I call an unholy alliance with the Russian Orthodox Church, whipping up religious support to justify its invasion of Ukraine and the persecution of other Christian denominations. According to one report, nearly 500 religious buildings and sacred sites in Ukraine have been destroyed by the Russian military since the start of the war last year. In Iran, the government uses Islam as a pretext to imprison Christians and others attempting to run non-Islamic places of worship. And those who attempt to convert from Islam to other faiths, make up their own mind about what they believe, face severe repression from friends and family. Repression that Iranian officials willingly overlook and even encourage. Of course, Iran's intolerance of people of faith does not stop at its borders. Hamas and Hezbollah, both supported by Iran, not only terrorize those of non-Muslim faith, but present, uh, re- prevent Muslims who live under their control from choosing the religion for themselves. Now, what is the answer to these overwhelming challenges. The answer, in short, is religious freedom. At Global Christian Relief, we're working to bandage and heal those who are broken by persecution. But we also advocate for religious freedom for everyone because its implementation means the end of the most severe forms of persecution. When religious freedom is protected, no one is killed or abducted for their faith, and people are free to pursue truth without fear. The advancement of religious freedom is also important to U.S. national security interests, as we're seeing every day in the news. When 
religious freedom is not protected, extremism and authoritarianism flourish. The more the U.S. can do to advocate and advance this critical freedom, the more we will deter the very gr groups who wish to do us harm. And with this in mind, I'd like to offer three recommendations. First, I would encourage this committee to encourage the Biden administration to appoint a special advisor for international religious freedom to the National Security Council. This position was first recommended by Congress with the passage of the Frank R. Wolf International Religious Freedom Act in 1998, but it's only been filled once by a dedicated official, and that would be a major step forward. Second, the members of this committee should consider sponsorship of House Resolution 82, called on, that calls on the Department of State to redesignate Nigeria as a country of particular concern. The CPC designation, as it's called, is reserved for the worst violators of religious freedom. And despite the failure of Nigeria's government to prevent the targeted killing and abduction of thousands of Nigerians on the basis of faith, the State Department removed this designation from Nigeria in 2021. And I believe this is unacceptable. I want to thank Representative Congressman Letourner and other members of this subcommittee who have already sponsored this resolution, which... Uh, also calls for a special envoy for that region. We'll be able to help bring resolution between the many countries in the Sahel region that need this help from extremism. And thirdly, I recommend that the committee directly encourage officials at the State Department to give the ambassador at large for international religious freedom greater leeway in calling out violations of religious freedom. So thank you so much. For, for this time to testify. I appreciate it.